I'm Margaret Preston, president of Power for Parkinson's, and today, in conjunction with our Pop Profile series, we have Christine Meldrum. Not only is she an author, but she's president and founder of Parkinson's Place Iowa. She's the ambassador at the Davis Finney Foundation, and she's also an exercise professional who works with people with Parkinson's and neurological disorders. Christine, thank you so much for being with here it's, with us today. It's such a treat. Thank you for having me. I am just thrilled to be here. Yeah, thank you. Well, if you're ready, we will just jump right in. Um, as many of our listeners know, we've modeled almost three years ago our own heat exercise program after your colleague, Dr. Daniel Corcus's re research around high intensity exercise for people with Parkinson's. So you being here, a true Parkinson's exercise expert is so in alignment with our mission and we're thrilled to have you. Um, I'd love to start with um, kind of hearing your synopsis of your background and how you got into all things Parkinson's exercise. Okay, so I have been a long time group fitness instructor. I did triathlons and cycling has always been my number one love. And I, um, I was helping my mentor who was teaching a Parkinson's cycling class. And as I was um, helping him, uh, it kind of changed the trajectory of my uh, professional exercise education path. And he actually ended up leaving the program. And these people were going to be stranded and not have their program anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I just couldn't let that happen. So I stepped in and I got the Parkinson's cycling coach cert. And um, then it all kind of the whole thing changed for me mm -hmm. because my road went everything Parkinson's. Yeah. And, you know, people ask me a lot. They say, you have no one in your family with Parkinson's. What, what made you do this? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that struck me the most when I was working with people with Parkinson's was how brave they were mm -hmm. in their fight against Parkinson's. And my, my mother had strokes okay. and she had three strokes. And one of the things that happened is she went blind mm -hmm. and she basically pulled herself up in her room and she never came out. Mm -hmm. So it was the exact opposite. Sure. And so when I saw these people every day coming in and fighting their disease, I was like, I want to help mm -hmm. these people yes. achieve what they're trying to do. And that is to beat this disease. Mm -hmm. So I went on and... Uh, one of the, the first things I did was to research because I'm, I, I'm all about research and uh, setting the science behind exercise. Mm -hmm. And that's how I went and studied Jay Albert's cycling research. Mm -hmm. And that, um, that just led to uh, implementing it into my um, community-based neuro programs. Okay. And then from there, I knew that for my people, to really tackle the disease, they really needed a whole spectrum of neuroprogramming. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. I created a program where they had um, everything to choose from. Mm -hmm. Cycling, Tai Chi, rock steady boxing, total health works, um, total Parkinson's, where they had that plethora of, of classes to choose from. And then I, what I also did was add to my, uh, my background in um, certifications and both in PD and NCCA um, certifications and certificates, because at the time and even now there is no uh, there is no Parkinson's um, uh, what do I want to say uh, specialist Parkinson's exercise specialist right you know so those of us that have been working with people with Parkinson's for 10, 20 years. We basically had to create our own education system mm -hmm. absolutely and you know to build credibility in the field mm -hmm. and so that's what i did and then when i so i was taking all this science and building it into the programming and i started working with jay alberts mm -hmm. oh gosh like seven eight years ago and i was we just started you know he was so thrilled because he was seeing his science put into and working in the community. And so it, for years, we talked about writing this book. And so it just finally happened. <laughs> so that's kind of how I got here. 
That's great. I love it. It sounds very <laughs> serendipitous and um, meant to be. And it takes someone with courage and determination to kind of seek out the the path that's not there already. And that is becoming an expert in Parkinson's uh, exercise. So thank you for sharing that. Thank um, you. Well, give us a quick overview of the science behind exercise for Parkinson, how it physiologically reduces the symptoms of the disease and can slow the progression. Yeah, I really like to do this when I give my talks. I'm gonna I'm gonna put on the little share and do a little um let's see, share here. And we're gonna start up at the top here. Perfect. So I really like to talk and share this with people when I am um, talk. Oh, let me find my little glasses here. Hold on. There we go. I really like to help people understand this because the light bulb tends to go on. Mm -hmm. When they understand what is happening in their brains to affect change in their bodies, mm -hmm. I find that people want to work out. Mm -hmm. And then when they when they when it starts actually working for them, they want to work out more. Yeah. So this is how the brain rewires for change. And this is basically from, um, and this is in the book. This is in the book, the Mahalakshmi's Mahalikshmi, uh, study. It's a review, actually, it's a review. And um, what he talks about is that when you're exercising, and it's whether you go to treadmill training, cycling, rock, rock steady boxing, that muscle starts contracting. And that re releases this really important hormone. And it's called the exercise hormone mm -hmm. and it's called irisin. And what that does is stimulate in the body or in the brain, uh, this protein that's really important called BDNF, brain derived neurotrophic factor. And that helps protect and preserve neurons, mm -hmm. right? Your, your neurons are getting damaged from the Parkinson's. Right. And this BDNF is helping protect and preserve it. And so what, and then all these things that come from this is that neuroprotection, the um, self survival, it improves memory and learning and mm -hmm. all these wonderful things are happening. And then he, they go on to talk about the positive effects of exercise that happens. And I'm going to quickly run through these because I talk about them in the book, mm -hmm. but it improves your, your mood and your sleep. It reduces stress and anxiety. It reduces insulin. And that's a very important thing uh, for people with uh, Parkinson's mm -hmm. because insulin is what causes tremor and bradykinesia, rigidity, and exercise reduces it. So when we talk about exercise reduces your symptoms, well, here's one of the ways that it helps reduce mm -hmm. that. Uh, symptom. And then we have inflammation. Well, inflammation for Parkinson's is what is what's progressing your disease. Right. And when we reduce that inflammation through exercise, that is one of the key things helping slow that progression. And then again, it really uh, releases growth factor mm -hmm. and new blood vessels. And these are all great things. Um, and the neuroplasticity and then abundance and survival of your brain cells. That is a fantastic synopsis of all, all the good benefits um, of exercise. And I, you mentioned your book. I would love to jump in and tackle so many amazing things noted in this book. Parkinson's, how to reduce, uh, how to reduce symptoms uh, through exercise. Uh, in the book, you note that, as we talked about, high-intensity exercise, which is exercise really targeted with a target of 80% of the maximum heart rate, is exercise that is required to control the symptoms and potentially slow the progression of the disease. Uh, at a high level, share with our listeners the science behind this concept. Okay. This is a really loaded question, and there's a <laughs> lot. <laughs> there's lots of questions within this question, but I will say this. We have had hundreds of scientists that have contributed to establishing Parkinson's exercise as a viable therapy for Parkinson's. Mm 
-hmm. And I um, put these three gentlemen on pillars because they really um, had the dramatic impact points throughout history that we look to. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to kind of quickly go through their three um, major stopping points, if you will. Mm -hmm. So first of all, in 2003, we had the Discovery Ride with Jay Albers Mm -hmm. riding across Iowa with a woman on the back with Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. It's a great story in the book. Yes. And he but he, she was getting better every time as they were going across this eight day, seven day ride across Iowa, which led to the 2007 clinical trial. And this was a, um, what became the forced versus voluntary mm-hmm. exercise study mm-hmm. that it, I mean, it like, it's still with us today. Mm-hmm. And I think Jay wishes he had never used the word forced. <laughs> it does People get all tripped up on that word force, Mm -hmm. but I will tell you, all force means, at the time he only used the word force because the person in the back was riding his hand on bike, the person on the back of the bike, their legs were being forced, if you will, to go faster than they normally may not be going. Right. And so that's the term force. Mm -hmm. But if we were looking at these words, force and voluntary today, Mm -hmm. It would simply mean high impact and low impact, right? Because a person today can ride the bike themselves and they can go at that high intensity. Mm-hmm. And I'll talk about why they can, they can do high intensity and it's not as hard as they think it is. And then low intensity. Mm-hmm. So I, I get that thing about forced all the time and people get really hung up on that word. I think he wouldn't have used that word if he could. Go yeah, it, it's amazing it. how time can change the meanings, but I don't think at the time we were saying high intensity. So well, no, that we weren't. And he, you word. know, at the time, at the time he was like, you know, at the time people weren't even doing any exercise, right? Literally. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was the first exercise for people with Parkinson's. Right. And he just thought, well, you know, they're forcing the legs to go faster. Yeah. Right. But the but the real point of the exercise was that people in the back were exercises. Mm-hmm. He, he really wants people to know they were working as hard as they could. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. They aren't, they aren't just uh, sitting back there going along for the ride. Right. They were working as hard as right. they could. And that, that is an important point to note. And so as far as maximum heart rate for that study, he had them increase every two weeks. He had them go 60%, then 65, then 70, then 75, and then 80. So that's where the maximum heart rate started for that. Okay. And for cycling, he went one more step. Mm-hmm. He went, the uh, cadence was 80 to 90 revolutions per minute. Okay. And 80 is normally kind of the goal. Sure. If you can get to the 80, that's kind of been the goal throughout. Okay. So the thing to note is that both groups improved aerobically. Their lung function, their risk for disease, their heart function, everything was great. Mm-hmm. But the high intensity group, the their rigidity, their tremor, their bradykinesia, gait, all those good things, they improved 35%. Wow. That was that's why it became a landmark study. Right. Because all of a sudden, wow, Parkinson's mm-hmm. people improved 35% mm-hmm. for their motor symptoms. And the low intensity or voluntary group, they were just pedaling at whatever pace they wanted. Sure. And what you note here is it was 0% Mm -hmm. for Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had heart and all that stuff, but what they really wanted was their Parkinson's. They weren't tackling the Parkinson's symptoms, yeah. Right, and that is the most important point for people to understand. Mm -hmm. There's a certain way you have to exercise if you want that Parkinson's. Yes. Symptom. Yeah. Get better. So then we have Sparks 2, and that was the study on Parkinson's disease of exercise. Huge study. This is like, this study like laid it all out for people to follow because it, number one, it looked at how was it safe for people 65, 75, and 85 to work at higher intensities. Mm -hmm. And second, 
It also is looking at slowing progression of disease and slowing symptoms. And that's where the 80 to 85 really locked in. Mm -hmm. And so it looked at high intensity versus moderate versus usual care, sure. meaning do what you normally do, which is nothing. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so they don't do the usual care in studies anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, so if you look, the usual care, this was in a this was a six month study. They got worse. Mm -hmm. on the Upter uh, study on the Parkinson's mm -hmm. rating scale. Mm -hmm. They got worse 3.3. The 60% group got worse 2.0 in motor symptoms. And look, that 80%, they didn't, they, they didn't, they didn't progress. Right. That's incredible. And that was like, wow. Mm -hmm. So that's, and that's kind of where that, okay, we know what intensity you have to work at. Mm -hmm. so that you can kind of stop or put a pin in that progression. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where that, that number came from. Got it. And then we had, oh, now we have Sparks 3. And Sparks 3, I just want to say, um, oops, I'm not hitting the right thing, is, is underway all across America and the U.S. Mm -hmm. And it's, again, validating those numbers. And um, it is going to it is looking at such a huge number of mm -hmm. things um, with Dr. Farkas mm -hmm. and it is going to bring back a wealth of information Yes, and great. It's going to really advance Parkinson's exercise, Absolutely. but I told him he gets to write the next book. <laughs> he gets to write the next book. That's right. <laughs> you can play sidekick on that one. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I love it. It's exciting to see, um, just the extrapolation of sparks. Um, and now we're in sparks three and what's going to come out of it. It is. It's a, it's a lot. And it's, it is super exciting to see mm -hmm. what they're going to bring back out of it. Right. That. Right. So then we had park and shape and that was a huge, huge study too, mm -hmm. because what that did is it took out, it took people out of the clinical environment and brought them home. Mm -hmm. And that had never been done before. Yes. And not only did it bring them home, but it gave them, um, they gave them virtual reality and extra game. Mm -hmm. And that was a first. And mm -hmm. that's uh, Dr. Bloom's study in the Netherlands. And they did the same thing. They were at the same, that using that 80 maximum heart rate three mm -hmm. times a week, you know, so establishing those measurements for people to go by. Mm -hmm. but, but his, the part two of the study was the most exciting. Mm -hmm. Because he, oh, the group, the second group did stretching and relaxation exercises, but they still got the uh, motivational apps and everything. Mm -hmm. And they got the uh, the VR and all that stuff, the same equipment that the group one got. But the phase two added MRI brain scans. And what they found is the most exciting because not only did the, um, well, this was, this was in phase one, the phase one went down 4.2 mm -hmm. in the, um, Parkinson scale that then the stretching group. Um, and like I said, they had the new equipment to, uh, VR and stuff to use at home, but the, the high intensity cycle group in phase two, it was, it's one of the few studies that shows in humans because we, they had only had animal studies, you, um, that, but it's one of the few studies in humans that, that showed, that demonstrated neuroplasticity working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, the other thing is the, the no shrinkage in the brain. Yeah, that's incredible. That is incredible. Mm -hmm. And I think that the main thing about that is that people, the Parkinson's, uh, the brain atrophy is a hallmark of Parkinson's. Right. And it's associated with the progression of motor and cognitive symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so for high intensity exercise to stop brain sh uh, shrinkage is mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, the other part was that the Parkinson's disease, the damage to the brain from the Parkinson's, the, the brain made new brain connections were formed mm -hmm. to the healthy part of the uh, brain cortex and that was the other amazing thing 
So it, it's really funny. Or when I was interviewing um, Boz Bloom about all this, he's like, I love it. He, he was like, if that doesn't excite you to exercise, I don't think anything will. <laughs> we want our brains to remain in the same shape, right? I mean, <laughs> the I mean, same size. Like, and he's right. It know? seems it very motivating. Like, yes. It it's should excite everybody to exercise. Absolutely. I agree. It's it's amazing. It so, is. and the brain atrophy worsened yeah. in the stretching group. It's incredible. Well, I'd love to jump in. I see your next slide is regarding my next question. Um, in the book, you have one of my most favorite pictures uh, I've ever seen regarding Parkinson's exercise. <laughs> Um, so much so that I took a picture with my phone and sent it to, of course, my father has Parkinson's and our community members. I just I love this picture because not only is it recommending exercise, but it's a fun way to kind of create your plan. Um, and when it's fun, we stick with it, right? So yeah. I'd love to talk about this PD exercise cocktail plan, as we may have guessed from the image um, shown on the screen. I would love for you to share at a high level what it means to create the cocktail and who should be on the patient team in building this plan. So the cocktail, um, it's, it's really about, it depends on what stage of, dis, you know, of your what stage of disease you're in? What are your goals? Do you have medical conditions? Um, so like if if I have someone and they're working with either a PT or an OT, I'll bring them in on building their plan. And so, you know, it just depends on what, who all is involved with the part on the Parkinson's care team. Mm -hmm. But if it, well, whoever wants to be involved, I certainly work with those people mm -hmm. to, bring them in on the discussion. And, um, but most of all, it's the person working with that person on building their plan because they have a blast. Right. And the plan is fluid. It changes. Mm -hmm. And so it's not something you're stuck with for the rest of your life. Yeah. It has to change as your Parkinson's changes mm -hmm. and as you decide to try different things. And I highly recommend trying different things mm -hmm. all the time mm -hmm. because there's so many things out there that I find that most people wouldn't dream of say trying a boxing class mm -hmm. or cycling is a big one and then when they do and then they they're so shocked that they love it mm -hmm. but they think they don't want to try it <laughs> right <laughs> and so I always have people go and sit, just go watch it. Mm -hmm. And halfway through they're yeah. in it. Yeah, so, absolutely. <laughs> so I brought, so let's go through this cocktail. Okay, this is perfect. my, this is Kay's. This is her exercise cocktail plan. She's someone okay. that I'm working with right now. Okay. And I love Kay's um, battle cry because um, first of all, I asked them, what's your favorite drink? It can be, or if some of them say, I don't drink anymore. And I'd say, well, what was it when you did drink? <laughs> and, yeah. Think and, or they'll things. say, or they'll say, um, I'll say, what's, what's a non-alcoholic drink you like? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's cause you can make it up for any. And Absolutely. so Kay's favorite drink is a screwdriver. Okay. And Perfect. so, um, so we came up with Kay's battle cry is, and I love it. Screw you Parkinson's. We like to be Perfect. funny with this, yes, this you know, wonderful. we like to have fun with it. Yep. And a lot of times if Kay is dragging uh, in her workout, I'll say, Kay, what's your, what's your uh, tagline? What's your battle cry? Oh, she'll go, oh, screw you, Parkinson's. Uh, I'll say, really, that's it? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Come on, what's your battle you say it cry? like you mean it. <laughs> and then she'll go, screw you, Parkinson's. Yeah, absolutely. And then she'll really get into her workout. So yeah. it's just kind of a fun thing, you know, that yeah. they have, that they identify with, you mm -hmm. know, and that's, it's important because yeah. they've come up with it and it's something that they can just really identify and it just gets them going. Yeah. It's a great thing. Absolutely. They love them. They love it. Good. So here we go. The cocktail starts, number one, it's high intensity training. It's aerobics. Uh, and we, we break down in the book, the, uh, 
each of these layers, if you will. Sure. And uh, so that goes back to the cycling or uh, treadmill training, mm -hmm. boxing, mm -hmm. anything aerobically that's going to sure. get your heart rate up. Uh -huh. And then two, for me, I, I like the PD specific work second. Mm -hmm. Daniel might say I should have put strength training second. But, <laughs> it's a good point. <laughs> you know, um, so, but I do think that you, uh, PD specific work, um, you need to have, and you know, a, a lot of these can intertwine and, mm -hmm. and can, depending on what you pick for your PD specific work, mm -hmm. can uh, fold in certain other classes. Mm -hmm. And then of course you have to have your progressive strength training. Um, and we'll get, we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then of course you need flexibility and balance. Mm -hmm. We're like, oh my gosh, I need so many things. And the cherry on the top or the olive in this case yeah. is what you love. Mm -hmm. And so in case uh, she does, she does cycling twice a week and we do okay. one boxing Okay. And then she does a total Parkinson's, which folds in several of the ingredients here. She does strength training mm -hmm. twice a week. And we also include some of that um, flexibility, mm -hmm. um, strength training, which she loves. And then the flexibility and balance she gets, we fold in, in during her strength training, we'll do some uh, balance work mm -hmm. while she's doing strength training mm -hmm. and then the total parkinson's that has a lot of uh the some flexibility and some balance work as right. well so and then for her she grows dahlias she oh, grows the wonderful. most beautiful dahlias uh -huh. in the world and that's what she loves okay and she also does a lot of um a, a lot of work in the community for parkinson's okay so that's that's crazy. a great mix that's a great drink <laughs> yeah she has a great drink she has a great battle cry oh that's wonderful the pd yeah. exercise cocktail plan thank you for sharing that christine you bet and thank you for the visuals it's always really helpful to kind of understand the science before we go into a little bit I more always, rapid fire questions yeah i always find that it helps people to understand it when they can kind of see it yes agreed absolutely agreed i appreciate that um you more or less answered the question in, in some of our science-based questions, but share, share your recommendations with people who have Parkinson's. Do they need a Parkinson-specific exercise program, or can they achieve the same efficacies with a simple gym membership? I think we know the answer, but playing devil's well, advocate. So I, I, I think that you know, it's important for people to do what's going, what they're going to do, what's, what, how to work out the way that they, what's going to work for them. Right. All right. So one of the things is that very, very few people in general are motivated to work out on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And a lot, of, and most people don't know what to do. And I'm just talking about the general population sure. yeah. without Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. And when you add Parkinson's to the equation, there is a very sneaky mm -hmm. symptom called apathy. Mm -hmm. And that apathy is very difficult for people to break through. Yes. And it's not that they don't want to exercise. A lot of times they do, but that symptom of apathy mm -hmm. is incredibly difficult yes. to deal with. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple stories in the book that, that, shows just how hard that apathy was to get through. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that knowing how to exercise is another thing. How to reduce symptoms is a crucial missing link in the, that's been missing in the dialogue. Sure. Um, and then putting together your whole exercise plan that's going mm -hmm. to work because right. For so long, people would work out and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And then they stop working out. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we don't want to happen. Right. Right. So there's there's all of these factors so for people with Parkinson's. I think if they are highly motivated and can take the information for themselves and work out of the gym by themselves, great. Mm -hmm. 
if they can't, they need to find a program like you have, right? Where they can have support, yes, camaraderie, mm -hmm. and you know the programs in place to really make it happen for them. Absolutely, you you dovetailed quite well into my next question um, because there's such a big pool of this population. What would you say to those individuals who have been diagnosed with Parkinson's and do not have a history of working out prior to diagnosis? So it really was a part of their, their daily process. Um, how do you get this population started? Who, of course, are a little hesitant, uh, maybe a little intimidated um, by the broad concept of the word exercise. Well, you know, I often tell my, my people I work with that Mr. Parkinson's does not take a day off. He does not. You're right. He does not. <laughs> and so they have to work diligently to take care of themselves mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. And the number one that thing that they can do for themselves and the people they love mm -hmm. is to exercise. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is, it's the only proven hope of potentially slowing the progression of the disease. Right. And if they aren't exercising, the disease is going to progress at a faster rate. And I feel that sometimes that discussion is not out there. Yeah. That your disease is going to, it's plummeting mm -hmm. the wrong way yeah. if you don't exercise. And so um, we, we need to exercise. It's just, it's something we have to do. Yeah. And so one of the things I tell, and the, I know people are afraid when they hear the high intensity exercise or the 80% of maximum heart rate and they kind of go, but I can't do that. And I, one of the things I like to say is, yeah, you can, mm -hmm. because it's not as hard as you think. Right. It's not. And when I, when I talk to groups, I say, um, I demonstrate for them. Mm -hmm. I have a person in shape and a person who hasn't been in shape. Mm -hmm. And I have them work out from 50%, 60%, 70%, 80%. And mm -hmm. when they see that person in shape has to work way harder right. than the person who's just starting, mm -hmm. they're like, oh, that's me. I I can do that. Yeah. Yeah. They have kind of a, a, a aha moment. They're like, it's the opposite of what they think. Yes. Yeah. Like it's going to be easier for the person who's in shape, but really it's going to be. Right. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. the opposite. Mm -hmm. And then I'll turn it and say, okay, let's as a group now do this and find it for yourself. Sure. Because I think it's really important for people to feel in their body. Yeah. What, what, does what that is their 80%? Yes. Yep. I think that's and cool. then they're like, and then after they do it, they go, well, that wasn't so bad. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you're like, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, if you take it away, the fear of what they hear. Yes. Then it's like, I okay. I agree. So I think it's important that for the, for people to understand and take that, you know, because it does sound, it sounds intimidating. Oh, absolutely. And I do think, um, I love that you touched on do it for your family members as well. Um, absolutely. we think that, well, I'm not necessarily motivated and that's okay if you're not able to motivate yourself just on your own behalf, but think about what you're giving to your loved ones. You're giving potentially time back. Um, yes quality of life back for yourself and for your loved ones to experience with you. So I love that you touched on, do it for your surrounding loved ones as well. Absolutely. Well, I because wanna... it's going to improve your quality of life for not only the person working out, but for oh, everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. And help foster your relationships for as long as you can preserve them. So yep. I love that. Yep. Um, I wanted to jump right in to a similar question. What would you tell people or what guidance would you give to people with Parkinson's who are early in the disease and may not be experiencing those more pronounced symptoms? Um, should they begin exercising immediately upon diagnosis, even if they're not terribly symptomatic? Is early intervention critical? I say, don't wait. Do mm -hmm. not wait until you have symptoms to start exercising. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you how many people come up to me uh, when I give talks after the talk mm -hmm. and they say, and it is heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. They are like, 
I wish I had started to exercise sure. or I spent two years in denial. And then there's this horrendous story. Right. I am just like, it's just horrible to hear these stories. And I hear them over and over again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I just, it's just, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's so horrible. Early intervention is key. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so you miss a window of opportunity mm -hmm. if you don't start right away. Right. And, you know, and it's a great window because you can push a lot off. Yeah. If you start right when you're diagnosed. Yeah. And the problem is, is that people that are uh, early onset think they have all the time in the world. Yes. They think that it's not going to start. Mm -hmm. The symptoms aren't going to show up mm -hmm. until. Right. But, the, but that doesn't always happen. Right. And so sometimes, and more often from what I hear than not, all of a sudden they're there. And, you know, right. I have several stories of, in fact, I have quite a few. I was surprised how many people I had that, that were early onset stories in the book. Mm -hmm. You know, they're fine one second. And then like Rhonda Fuller, yeah. she's in a wheelchair yes. the next second. Yeah. I mean, if you think about the, how you see people with Parkinson's progress more times than not. It almost seems overnight progression than the slow progression sometimes. Um, I do, we do see that in our community where all of a sudden a community member is no longer able to do X and it almost seemingly happens overnight. And that is because- You don't know when. Well, and it's because it, it progresses at a rapid rate. People don't understand how fast it goes, you know, when you don't yeah. use exercise as, right. a, as a therapy to help you. Right. And so I, I tell people that, okay, exercise as soon as, as you can. Yes. But the good news is even if you haven't started yet, it's never too late to start. Yes. So there is that good. It's possible to get results no matter when you start. It just may take longer the later you start. Yes. It may take longer if you start later. And so, but it is possible and it just, you know, I've been, I have witnessed incredible results for people on their journeys Absolutely. and, you know, their amazing stories are in the book. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's, it, and it's, it always, I, I just get uh, speechless like right now when I think yeah. of them, you know, I, there are. And again, I'm going to hold this up and I'll continue to hold it up during our interview because uh, not only is the research in this book, but those stories are in it. Those real life, real patients, real people with Parkinson's, those stories are in this book. So, um, and I loved the balance between the research and, and the the real stories and yeah. how they marry together. So yeah. um, I'd like to ask you about um, other parts of a care plan for people with Parkinson's. So of course, exercise is a critical component, as we talked about, for a comprehensive care plan. Um, one will continue to focus on, of course, but what are some of the other components of a PD care plan that one might need to consider? So for me, there's three things, and you're probably going to think that this goes with exercise, but it kind, mm -hmm. and it kind of does. Mm -hmm. But my biggest current concern is nutrition. Yeah. So from when, and protein. Mm -hmm. So I have the toughest component for when I'm working with people is they, their diets and they don't get enough protein to fuel their workouts. They come to work out and they, they eat the same foods that they were eating before they were working out. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't eat enough food to do a 45 minute cycle class or a 60 minute boxing class or yeah. a 45 minute strength training class. Right. And then they wonder why, why can't I get through this? Right. Because you're it's not like, properly fueling yourself. <laughs> right. They, well, I, well, I ate a, um, I ate two, uh, a yogurt. I ate mm -hmm. a yogurt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, you're an athlete now. Yes. yes I love that. <laughs> I love what you just said. You're an athlete now. You're an athlete now. Yeah. And you have to fuel your body like it. Oh, um, absolutely. That's what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we need to fuel your body like an athlete. And a biggest thing for that is protein. Yes. And 
However, there is my second problem or that's difficult with a protein for them. And I, if anybody, I, I, I ask everybody about this and I don't know anyone who knows the solution because of the medications they take, mm -hmm. it's hard because of the window of time with right. medications of getting that protein right. into their bodies. Sure. But it's what they need. I mean, you yeah. can't be doing strength training without enough protein. Right. So it is very, it's, that's like one of my things. Yeah. No, I love that you have shot nutrition. I, I love nutrition. that. Yes. Um, and this, then on, on that, what comes with that then next is water. Mm -hmm. Water. Yes. yes. They don't drink water. I think that was one of my pages I earmarked in my book because <laughs> the emphasis on water that you had placed water. Was, was a bulleted list, including nutrition. Water. Um, the water, right? They come to a class to, to do a cardio and they don't bring water. I would, yeah. I bring cases of water to classes yeah. oh. because they yeah. don't drink water okay. and they'll laugh and say, well, I ha I, I'll have to go use the restroom. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, I know, but you still have to drink That's water. Okay. Right. You know? <laughs> because, you know, you should have a, probably a bottle an hour or two before you mm -hmm. should be drinking one during the class and right. at least one after. Right. And I'm, you know, I can't convince them to drink water, how yeah. important it is that they need water in their yes. bodies. Absolutely. So that's another thing I would like to figure out. Yeah. Um, so a nurse told, this is a, 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 tr a trick uh, that a nurse told me and I tried this and it's true. So okay. at least it worked for me, for people uh -huh. with Parkinson's and having to go to the bathroom. Yes. So she told me that if you sip water, you have to go to the bathroom more frequently, mm -hmm. which all my people were doing. Okay. And she said, and she works with Parkinson's people. Mm -hmm. She said, if you drink that water, like in a big gulp, okay, you will go have to go to the restroom less okay. frequently. I tried that method, the sipping versus, and it's true. Okay. So I tell my people of Parkinson's this. So just go down. <laughs> I'll give you a little cocktail in one hand and your water in the other. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So try this out. If yes, nutrition and water are critical. So that you can get more water into you. Absolutely. Gulp it down. <laughs> yes. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I don't know. And then the third thing is sleep. Now, sleep is truly important. And here's a probably a good thing to know is if you exercise, you're going to sleep better. Okay. And this could be a motivational factor yeah. in getting you to hopefully want to yeah. work out. So it does help you sleep. You're describing um, just such an iterative care plan, right? Like each piece is almost dependent on the other. And right. each one piece can lead to the success of the next piece. Sleep right. is critical. Well, if you exercise, which is also critical, it could benefit your sleep. So I like right. the interconnectivity that you're describing in each important um, component. And while one is important, the whole plan is important. The whole plan is important yeah. to you. To, so you can successfully, yes. you know, and all of these things are going to turn around and help you with your symptoms yes. for Parkinson's. Yes, and that's that's our goal. Well, and that's the life. goal, yeah. right. Absolutely. Well, in the book, I know we touched on in our cocktail plan, but also the um, in the book you mentioned, or you talked thoroughly about progressive strength training. So yes. share with our listeners what this means and how one can begin a progressive uh, strength training program. All right, so progressive strength training is exactly what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. you're, you're progressively overloading the muscles mm -hmm. with weights mm -hmm. so that the muscles are going to grow and get stronger mm -hmm. in time. It also helps. It's going to change the brain a lot like what you saw in mm -hmm. that uh, slide that I um, put up there. Con the muscles contracting yes. and doing all that. It's going to yeah. work the same way. So from the age of 40 on, we all start to lose muscle mass. Mm -hmm. Muscle mass is what they call sarcopenia. Mm -hmm. And then we lose muscle strength. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and that is dynamite. Mm -hmm. And why is this important? And this is important for everybody, mm -hmm. the world, everybody. Absolutely. That this it changes our our balance, our gait, our overall ability to form to perform simple daily tasks. Mm -hmm. But the big kicker is for it it contributes to falls. Mm -hmm. So you have people with Parkinson's already falling, and then you have this contributing to falls. Sure. And that is something that we don't want. Yeah. But it's preventable, treatable, and reversible with progressive strength training. So all of us, if we're all over 40, we all should be doing strength training. Yeah. Because what happens is as you keep losing, 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 it turns into frailty. Mm -hmm. And frailty sends us all into you know, the nursing home. Absolutely. With fractured hips. Right. You know, all those things that we don't want to end up. With. Right. So that is why the progressive strength training is really, really important. Okay. Thank you. I think, you know, I don't, I don't think there's a, a lot of emphasis on that. And I think that's a point to, for us as a Parkinson's community to convey, um, because we all think of the endurance. Um, right the kind of aerobic component, but the progressive strength training sometimes falls by the wayside, even though it's just as critical. Well, and it's doing the same thing for you as the, um, the aerobic part mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. as, you know, but it's also this component of, you know, keeping your, um, your strength so that we really help helping the gate train, the mm -hmm. gate and oh, the yeah. falls and all of that. It's yeah. Like, the core keep, keeping the, your, core. yes. Yes. And that, and your, your lower body leg strength is so Absolutely. important, you know, the ability to do that, you know, it's funny. Cause I just, uh, I taught a total Parkinson's class yesterday and we were, I had them all do sit, uh, sit to stance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them were like, um, I'm like, well, you know, for your assessment, you have to do this many in 30 seconds. Uh -huh. And they're all like, oh dear. <laughs> you know? Oh dear. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, well, we need to start maybe working on this yeah, a little more. Absolutely. Because um, I once had a friend, and this she was uh quite young. Mm -hmm. And she she couldn't get off her the toilet up. Yeah. Yeah. And it scared her because she was yeah. quite young. And then she started doing strength training mm -hmm. and within a couple months, you know, cause she thought, oh my gosh, I'm too young for this to happen to me. Right. And if I can't get up, what am I going to do? Right. Where's this going to lead me mm -hmm. to not have enough leg strength to do yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. And so that's what you have to think of. And so she was going down that rabbit hole mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. you know, loss of muscles, uh, mm -hmm. strength and all of that. Yeah. And if, and it's, it's really important. And I, I know people just don't really think about it. Yeah, no, I mean, that is a prime example and prime story of showing how it impacts your daily life, your, just your daily right. functions, not just, um, you know, being limited in maybe the fun things that you can no longer do, but truly just the everyday tasks, going to the bathroom, right. washing your teeth, right. all the things going up and down the stairs. Exactly. Um, all the things that we have to do as humans. Right. So, and just um, one no, day, it's just wake up and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't. Right. Just... It's a profound <laughs> example as to why, because you know, <laughs> when you're down, you want to be able to get back up again. Exactly. Um, exactly. Well, talking so. about some of the barriers and education barriers and some of just the general barriers to exercise, whether they're put on by oneself because of their perception of exercise, or maybe it's cost or a lack of knowledge or education um, and not understanding the, the emphasis that exercise should have on your, on your world as a person with Parkinson's. What do you think has been the biggest barrier to people with PD around the country and really understanding how imperative exercise is, the, is to really the comprehensive PD care plan um, and how, how important it is overall on PD symptoms. Um, you know, I think in other words, why is it still a little novel to people? Um, where does yeah. it fly? Well, I do think that one of the biggest barriers is it hasn't become a national news level discussion. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, it's just hasn't reached every household. Yeah. And and also the messaging hasn't been clear and consistent. Yeah. There's, you know, it's 
there's still, you know, I still hear so many different versions and it's confusing to people. It is. It's so confusing. You know, that's one of the things, the things feedback that I get from everybody. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. For, you know, number one, explaining it mm -hmm. and putting the how. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, the, you know, how yeah. to do that. Yeah. Because it, the how is missing. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. I was, I was really... I got tired of waiting for somebody else to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no one's ever going to do it. So right. Let's, yeah. You know, I'm like, okay, Jay, he get, he would laugh at me, you know, should we do it? Because we've been talking about it for years. <laughs> and then when I finally started sending him drafts, he's like, you're really going to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, We're someone gonna... has to. And honestly, the biggest question I've received since communicating, I've read it. People are saying, people with Parkinson's are saying, is the how in it, is um, guidelines are tangible things I can pick up and execute on in it. And I said, yes, it's not just theorizing about exercise. The right. research is there, of course, right. but there are takeaways. The PD cocktail pan, there are tangible takeaways you can take to your doctor, your exercise coach, put your OT, PT. Right you guys can work together to make that cocktail. So um, that's the biggest part. One of the most important things about your book is that you do have the how in it. Um, and people can can kind of have that prescription, if you will. Right, um, right. Because I think it's intimidating. It's daunting. There's so much information. There's so much misinformation. So yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, they've defined the, you know, how, and the, the prescription, you know, you had that question too, that comes from the scientists. That's what, the, that's their quest. Their mm -hmm. quest is to define the uh, exercise prescription, you know, and they've, and they've done it in a general, what they call a general way. Mm -hmm. How long, what heart rate, you know, those, the time and the frequency, those mm -hmm. are the things that they have defined. And then I love Jay talks about in the future, you know, you'll walk in and put it, give them all your information and we'll put it into a computer and it's going to spit out every, how much you, you personally need to work out yeah. what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And it's going to tell you how much your symptoms are going to get better. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that be remarkable? Well, I mean, that's, that's what he's working for. I know. And it doesn't, <laughs> it, honestly, it doesn't seem implausible right in our life. right I know. And, like, mm -hmm. and then daniel's like oh yes and then you can throw in your blood work and it will tell you that your inflammation is this high and we can do i mean it's like wow that's what Absolutely. we're working on you know and so you cool. think about what a gift that could be to neurologists oh, to yeah. say here's your printout uh you know and have that to be able to give to patients and then you've got something to kind of work with and assess at your next appointment Right. Exactly. Just, exactly. It would be quite, it would be pretty amazing. And it's, it's exciting. It is. It really uh, is exciting. And, and I think it takes, I can't thank you enough because I think it takes people to cohesively paint the exercise picture um, on the national and international stage, really, um, to kind of paint that cohesive picture. So someone had to step up and kind of, you know, start waving the flag, like exercise, exercise, exercise. And this is what we mean by exercise. So I can't thank you enough for making this a resource. Well, it's kind of like, it's, so my background is in marketing and writing and all that. So I kind of have, and then have the exercise, my, my two worlds kind of joined almost perfectly mm -hmm. to do it mm -hmm. so and and I love the stories I love the science I love the stories I like yeah. and you have to have both yes so that people can oh yeah can see how it's it all happening. fits absolutely right? well I'd love for you to share I know where I got my copy but share that oh. where people can get this remarkable resource where they can purchase Parkinson's <laughs> how to reduce symptoms through exercise um, and get a copy and have this resource in their home. So um, you can get the book on Amazon and I'm about, the printed version is there. I'm about to upload a e, e version, ebook oh, version. Okay. Yeah. And I do hope that, um, I do want to say that 
the book is written. It's number one, it's a great resource. It's a great resource and it's something you can go back to your whole Parkinson's journey. Yeah. Because if you're like stage one, there's certain things that you're going to want to look through in this mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. And then later on, if you're stage three, you're going to go back and certain stories are going to hit you uh -huh. different, different meanings. and yeah. certain things are going to, you're going to read. It, it's just going to always be something you can go back and read so again too. and again. And mm -hmm. it's just going to be, uh, there's so much resource material in yeah. here as well as stories and science and everything. I, I've already heard that from so many people who have read it several times. Yeah. <laughs> That's like, yeah. it's never read it. there's yeah, something the different in there. Everything. But it's just, it's just a book that you can, you know, you'll, you'll keep forever. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that um, you can read it in any order. Yeah. There's some people that like, they want to read all the science stuff first. Mm -hmm. And some people want to read all the stories first. And yeah. some people, it's written so that you can, you can read it out of order. Yeah. So, um, and the other thing, what was I going to say? There's one more thing. Oh, I do hope that um, your question about people start not wanting to start a program or mm -hmm. just just getting into being a little hesitant. Yeah, yeah. Do and I mentioned it before, but if you have never tried something, do try. Call or call or go to a class. Tell tell the instructor you're coming ahead of time, and. Um, sign a waiver because halfway up you're going to get you're going to stand up and you're going to want to participate in the class i promise mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. um people that are teaching should be teaching classes um for all levels mm -hmm. so it doesn't matter what level you are they should be instructing that class so that you feel good and comfortable mm -hmm. and so just try I, you know just try things yeah. no matter what get yeah. it, just get out there and try it. You will have fun. You'll find community and camaraderie. Yeah. And that is really the, that's the beauty of exercise programs. You will just, you'll have such a support system that you will never have known was possible. I, I don't even want to say anything because it's just <laughs> such a wonderful way to end it. That, that is just lovely sentiment and it warms my heart because right here at the local level, that's exactly what we're trying to achieve and having all levels of people with Parkinson's come to mm -hmm. our exercise classes, have the camaraderie, camaraderie the community. Um, we've had so many people come, well, I'll just come and watch when I start sharing about the program and they inevitably get up and they exercise for a little while in there and then they come back. So, um, yep. That's you have summarized the beauty <laughs> of being in this space um, and the impact exercise can not only have, of course, on the physical symptoms of Parkinson's, but also um, giving people that community and those friendships that oh, yeah. they form from the program. Absolutely. It's, you know, it is the most important part. I mean, it's all, it's all of it. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and once people experience that, they just... I mean, I've had the same group with me for like, you know, 10 years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, we typically you know, tell folks, um, so of course we serve Central Virginia area, but for people across the nation, we typically tell people, find go online, um, you know, look for local foundations, or maybe mm -hmm. there's a chapter of a national foundation there. Yeah. What do you do to recommend um, exercise components or exercise um, programs rather to people in other areas? So, you know, I, you know, I did list a bunch mm -hmm. of resources um, to go to in the book. And, you know, the Parkinson's Foundation has, um, they have a great, uh, hotline, if you will. Yes. And you can call them and actually ask to where to find um, Parkinson's programs or Parkinson's um, classes. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I do want to say about the Parkinson's Foundation, they are the accrediting arm for Parkinson's programs. Mm -hmm. So if, and you will see this in the book, it's very important. I wish I had my color version of it. Oh, the photos in the ebook are color. Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. That is exciting. <laughs> But they, so if you see these blues, they're blue, these seals, mm -hmm. um, they are, that means that it, they have been accredited and the, the, the programs or the class uh, mm -hmm. programs or courses 
for people that are teach uh, teachers. Um, so like for say rock steady boxing is accredited through, they've gone through a stringent pro process to become accredited through the Parkinson's foundation. So it's really important to know that, you know, you're going to things that are safe. Sure, and absolutely. so um, that's kind of have them vetted a bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's good to know. But so the Parkinson's Foundation is a, a great place, uh, resource to go to. That's great. Well, Christine, I can't thank you enough for sharing your time, um, sharing kind of the behind the scenes, uh, meat and potatoes of crafting an amazing resource that'll be here for years and through one's journey with Parkinson's disease. So you've shared your time with our pop profile series and we're very grateful for that. And we're excited to share our interview with our community. Oh, yay. Well, I was really excited to be here and, um, yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you.